companies are starting to recognize that the social good clearly correlates to who you are as a company, what your brand is, how you gain competitive advantage, and how you are setting the stage for those who are early in career and those who care about it. Those are the future of our organizations, and they care about it more than anything else. Welcome to Redefiners, a podcast designed for daring leaders who are changing what it means to lead in today's increasingly complex world. I'm Nanas Motoshami, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. And I'm Clark Murphy, the former chief executive and also a leadership advisor. Nanas and I have spent our careers exploring what works and what's next in the realm of leadership. In each episode, we ask our guests deep and provocative questions about how they challenge the norms and how they've redefined their organizations and ultimately themselves as leaders. Also, you can answer this one question. How are you redefining your leadership? Perhaps the boldest question yet. Conversations that matter. Inspiration for us all, whether you're kicking off your career or crafting your legacy. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. We are in for a great episode today, as we're going to be talking with a leader who's really, truly at the heart of technology, digital transformation, and creating an inclusive world. Clark, I am super excited to meet our guest and really to hear about how she's driven digital transformation. It's something that literally every single one of my clients is struggling with. And our guest has done it successfully in such a wide array of organizations from sort of the industrial setting to technology organizations, even to the public sector. So very keen to hear lessons learned and how she's done it. But I'm actually also very curious to connect with her on a personal level. Um, Like me, she has a bit of an eclectic background and she's originally from London. So keen to hear her early childhood stories, too. Well, I'm really excited. I've known her for quite some time and was fascinated before we ever met in person when she moved to help the UK government from the US corporate world. I heard about her long before I met her and said she must be unique and then actually went and actively recruited her and tried to woo her, which we ultimately did to the board of Russell Reynolds Associates, which is a major coup. And she has been teaching me and needling me and helping me ever since then. Clark, tell us who she is. Our guest is Jackie Wright, the Chief Digital Officer at Microsoft US. She previously was the Chief Digital and Information Officer for HMRC, which is the British Government Tax Authority, if you can believe it. She served in CIO roles with BP and GE, couldn't be more different organizations. She's a member of the Board of Directors for Invent, Exelixis, Russell Reynolds Associates, our very own, and serves on a number of technical advisory boards. And she was also recently named the United Kingdom's most influential black person by the Power List 2022. If I was not intimidated before, I am now. Jackie, welcome to Redefiners. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nanaz, and thank you, Clark. Uh, Don't be intimidated, Clark. You know it's just Jackie. (laughs) (laughs) Jackie, you have such an interesting family story, so we'd love to start there. Um, If I'm not mistaken, your father was born in Jamaica, but actually served in the British Royal Air Force during World War II, which I think is fascinating. You yourself were born in London, but moved to the US before university. So take us back, tell us a little bit about family life and what prompted the move and how maybe that move changed your view of the world. Yeah, sure. And, you know, the family construct really defines who you are. I don't know about you, Nanaz, and you, Clark, but I know my family sure did. I think if you think about the race relations in the UK at the time, it was very difficult for my dad, but, you know, very stoic man. And, you know, he always tried to tell us, you know, we could do and be anything. And it's not what you do, it's who you are and what you do with that that really matters. Yes, he decided, well, you know what, as I look at the US, they're going through a whole bunch of things relative to movements and, you know, race and why don't I go to the, to, the, to the U.S. and why don't I take my children there? Because I think the opportunity would probably be better as it relates to some of the things that he thought he was facing in the U.K. You know, I, I went kicking and screaming to the, to the U.S., kicking and screaming, literally. Every anniversary, my brothers and sisters call me and say, do you remember when you flooded Heathrow Airport <laughs> with your tears? Oh, Every year, oh. never fails, they call me. <laughs> Jackie, where do you say you're from? 
if someone says sort of, where are you from? What's your answer? And I ask that because, so for me, I'm originally Iranian, or actually I, I use the word Persian because it just sounds a bit more exotic. Yeah. When I'm in the UK, I am firmly Iranian. But when I go back home, oh no, I'm 100% British. I feel so yeah. different. I sound so different. It's interesting because, you know, my family will say, well, you're you're English. You're, you're Jamaican. God knows what you are, you know. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I use the phrase, I, you know, I am British with Jamaican heritage and I've lived in the U.S. for a long time. And so all of those three things, I use that when someone says, where are you from? I say, well, let me tell you the story. Do you think that sort of having had these different perspectives throughout your life, is one of the things that has maybe helped you be successful in a career and to be able to work in such different organizations. You almost kind of learn to choose the best bits, right, of each culture, depending on where you are. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it even started earlier on than ours, because when I was growing up, when I was in secondary school, I was the person who always had to take the children who came from another country. I was the ambassador, always. Then when I went to the U.S., Oh my God, was that a culture shock, right? And so I had to adapt again, you know, who's this little British black person? And she sounds so funny. I remember when I did a soliloquy from Macbeth and they all looked at me like, wow, she really sounds like she's done it before. <laughs> and they've never seen anything like it, right? <laughs> this notion of trying to adapt in a myriad of environments and really having a heightened awareness for what it's like to try to adapt. I think that has been a superpower for me as I think about my career, how I create an inclusive environment, how I listen to the quietest voices in the room, and how I make sure that I'm connecting with people. So you're absolutely right. I wholeheartedly agree with you. It becomes a superpower. But I guess for me, I have only seen it as a superpower probably in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. In my earlier life, I hated standing out. I hated being different. And I, you know, wish I could dye my hair blonde. I you know, I wish I could look British in what is stereotypically British. Did you ever have that? Or does it go back to what you said your father tried to do, which is kind of instill that confidence in you being comfortable in who you are, irrespective of what you sound like and what you look like? So let's be clear, having confidence, I'm still an introvert. And yes, I don't like the attention. My comms manager will tell you, Jackie, I know you don't want to do this, but you have to. And so I don't know that I'll ever overcome that to be frank, but I do know it's important because role modeling and helping others is part of what leadership's all about. While yes, to your point, Nanaz, yeah, it is uncomfortable. You know, you don't want to stand out. People are always trying to find ways to understand who you are. At the end of the day, that's what makes you interesting. And you use that to your advantage, not just for yourself, but to help others in the world, elevate their voice, amplify their voices. And so it, it is integral to who I am. I completely agree. Must have been, I mean, it's one thing to go country to country and corporation to corporation. To go back to the British government at HMRC must have been yet another culture shock <laughs> and adapting to government. What was that like? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, when I first got the call, I was like, hmm, I have a perception of government. But let me tell you, the chairman CEO really characterized his ambition. And that ambition broadly centered around transforming a country and using the tax authority as somewhat of the launch pad to be able to do a whole raft of things, everything from using the data to inform policy to really improve social services across all aspects from DWP and Nanaz, you'll know what I'm talking about, but all the way from Department of Work and Pensions all the way through to the NHS because you understand the life journey of a citizen to then, oh, by the way, Brexit, just, just a little thing out <laughs> right. there, Brexit. So all of those things, it was just a really exciting and fascinating. And truth be told, I was one, if maybe there were only two, director generals of color in the whole of government. And mm. the added responsibility there to help focus on diversity as a core capability within government. So there were a lot of things that attracted me to really wanting to come in and understand, you know, tax and how we change the narrative. We help people understand how we pay for public services and why tax matters. Jackie, how do you go from working in an organization like BP or GE to HMRC? Like your leadership style must fundamentally change to be successful now. 
it has to change because culturally government is different from the private sector. But there's this notion of bringing both of those two things together, private and public, to share best practices across how you do things culturally, what's important. Um, yes, how you infuse capability in government where you can't exactly pay for capability, uh, right? How you innovate in government. Yes, you've got these long cycles. You've got a spending review. You've got the whole you know, policy, which are cycles, like a big industrial business. But at the end of the day, what matters is what you do with that to provide improved services for your citizen and for the economy. And that, no matter what, again, aligns to my moral values and what's important. As we think about digitally transforming a society, how do we make sure we bring everyone along? People are motivated because it's the government and it's the right thing to do. And they have an altruistic and moral compass around what's important. You know, you have to think differently about how you lead in that environment. Yeah. Mm. Uh, adapting seems to be a theme in your life. Let's, let's go back a little bit. So technology, you didn't start out in the technology world. You came to this over time. Yes. Tell us about the journey to being so integrally involved in digital transformation, public or private. And how did it start and how did you get on the technology path? Yeah, it, it was a quick path, actually. Um, <laughs> I did a part-time job in a bank where I was doing manual work. And over in the corner, again, I you know, always date myself, it was an IBM PC. And I went over there and there was like Lotus 123 and DBase and WordPerfect. I was like, what is this stuff? And what used to take me all week took me the press of a button because I automated that really fast. And then I was like, wait a second, this isn't too bad. I got this reputation in the bank, Clark, of being this little college kid who, I don't know what she's doing there, but she's creating these things for us. That's making it easier for us to do our job. Huh, transformation 101. <laughs> They said to me, what can we do for you? You know, we really like what you're doing. And I said, well, I, I, this technology stuff just seems to be really great. How about I go into the technology department? And they put me into that department where, you know, mainframe, big computers, trading systems, and one woman who was in that organization. And that was where I started. She took me under her wing. I, you know, I tell the story of how she always told me, watch out for this guy. This guy's a derailleur. This one's an influencer and helped me navigate a male-dominated environment. And that really taught me about, you know, what my role needs to be in mentoring and sponsoring as I go through my career. It was a fascinating first step. Let's move and talk about digital transformation, what you do best, Jackie. It's something that's impacting almost every industry and every sector of the economy. I do a lot of work with medical device and diagnostic companies, um, and honestly, Again, it's with every single client, the question comes up of how do they morph into more of a data and analytics or an AI company, which for them is really hard because inherently they're a product based or they have been a product based company. Rather, it may be a naive assumption, but my assumption is that in a massive technology company like Microsoft, that kind of digital transformation is easy. Because you're a tech company anyway. I'm probably wrong. Tell me what that transformation's been like at Microsoft, what the challenges have been and how you found it. You could start by saying we need to be outcome focused, right, on, on things and understand the art of what's possible. Because if you don't understand the art of what's possible, you can't lead people to change to something that they don't even, they can't visualize, they can't understand what it, what it could be. And in a company such as Microsoft, I think the, the tipping point was how do we make sure we stay relevant? I mean, if you think about it, we had a new leader. So the tone was set from the top. New leader who sets out his vision about, you know, we need to be customer obsessed. Two, the move to the cloud is that, from a transformation perspective, is what will help customers transform and accelerate their transformation. And we need to develop that, drink our own champagne, make sure we learn how to do it, and then tell our customers what that looks like. And then innovate in an agile way. Products to market faster. And you need to reward the right behavior that you want. These are the building blocks of how you transform an organization. And I think, you know, we're not done. We have issues, who doesn't? Um, we still have to work through how we create a, a culture that everyone feels that they can participate in, but we've made progress. And I think that's what's important 
demonstrating progress, demonstrating the intent, envisioning and helping people understand the art of what's possible and how you get there and rewarding the right behavior. And is that consistent with, because you spend, in your role, you also spend a lot of time with your customers, right? Talking to them about their digital transformations. I mean, those steps that you laid out, super clear, make complete sense. Are they, are they steps that apply to most companies it's, and most industries? They are steps that apply to every company. I mean, the culture, creating the right environment, the right conditions to be able to do that requires you to understand what are the barriers in your organization. And you can't do that unless from the top down, you are introspective and constantly looking at what are the barriers that are inhibiting us from really transforming to where we want to go. And I think to, to answer your question, and as yes, every organization needs to be able to be thinking about those things. How you apply them may be different, but really those building blocks are the building blocks for transformation. Between pandemics, supply chains, trade wars, Brexit, it, there's so much uncertainty to manage, more than 30 years of my career than I've ever seen at one time. We hear about agility and resilience used a lot, um, this ongoing learning. How do you lead yourself, your style, to help your teams adapt to change faster and take advantage? You talked about this uh, innovate in agile way to be faster to market. What's your way to either push or pull your teams as a great leader? I think, Clark, it, it starts with you as a leader understanding what you need to do to engender the right environment. Do I have the right traits, characteristics to really lead and inspire the team? Um, so I have to first make sure I'm fully self-aware of who I am as an individual and as a leader. Am I really looking at how I lead an organization through change and am I understanding what are those characteristics? So I think that's probably one of the first things as you think about who you are. Um, the second relates to as, as you think about the organization construct, do you have the right leaders in place? Going through a transformation requires people to adapt to change. Creating the right environment for a listening culture is also what's really important. You have to be empathetic to people's needs. Um, you know, there are people who can't make the journey for yeah. reasons that yeah. you are responsible for making sure that they can. Yes. Yeah. Even helping them recognize that they're not fit for this organization and they need to move on. You have to have that insight and be able to, to glean and have this empathetic muscle about who individuals are, who leaders are. You have to lead with vulnerability. I mean, we all make mistakes. And if we don't accept that we make mistakes, People won't want to talk to you because you think you're a know-it-all. And I don't want to talk to a know-it-all. I don't know about you. I want to talk to people who say, oh, help me understand what I need to do differently. Or you mm. tell me your views. You know, that kind of a cultural environment is what makes people want to be a part of your organization. How you inspire, how you listen, all of those things, I, I believe, are characteristics of leadership that is required as you think about transforming. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Clark, I've got a question for you. How much of what Jackie has said in terms of what you need to do to get a digital transformation right, how much of that do you think we've done at Russell Reynolds? What's been your experience in terms of leading digital transformation for us? You know, I thought the, the biggest issue would be figuring out what to do with what tools, how quickly. The path and the tools were simple culture change and getting particularly the senior most people in our firm to be willing to change. The change management is about our managing directors acting. It's not about finding the right tool, the right path, and the right time frame. It was our culture saying, I will change how I do things day to day to be more efficient or more digital. And I think that's an important point. You know, as I talked about how you as a leader inspire, you have to help folks understand what's in it for them. If you can't see yourself in it, you're going to be part of the problem. Right. No doubt about it. Uh, you know, I would ask both you, Nanaz and Clark, what are you seeing from a Russell Reynolds leadership perspective in terms of the types of leaders that people are looking to hire? Someone will come to you, Russell Reynolds, and say, well, you know, we need a leader because we're going through a big transformation. What are they asking for? <laughs> and do they know what they're asking for? Different leaders are right for different times. 
once upon a time, it was the vision thing and envisioning what was coming. And then it was cost cutting or offshoring or right. efficiency and then growth, growth, growth. Now it's people, first of all, the hierarchical days are over, right? So you've just said it again and again and again. Can you listen to an organization and listen to a market to adapt as opposed to sitting on the top of the mountain and telling that, that those days are gone forever? So number one is listening in a flatter organization to customers or employees. Second is agility. Can I pivot fast because the world changed quickly? We certainly learned that in the pandemic, if not through other ways. And then dealing with ambiguity. Like, I'm not going to have all the answers, so I've got to make a decision. So I, I think it's the listening of a market or your own organization, the agility to pivot quickly, and then ambiguity doesn't spook you. If it does, you can't really lead well in a world like today. Absolutely. Nanaz, are you seeing the same thing? A hundred percent, yes. And and Jackie, the way it sort of practically manifests itself is, you know, the number of CEO searches that at least I do today where the client will say, and look outside the sector because they're looking for exactly those things, right? It's not about how much domain expertise they have. It's how right. agile they are because they can learn it. That's exactly right. That is the new leadership, right? We'll be right back with Jackie. But first, let's take a quick break with Nick Cha, a managing director in our Singapore office. Nick dives in how to get and maintain your organization's technology advantage. When it comes to technology, today's leaders need to adapt or fall behind as the pace of change accelerates and innovation cycles shorten. But it's not just about adopting the latest tech. That's table stakes, and alone, it won't lead to competitive advantage. So what are the keys to staying ahead of the curve? We've identified four factors that define tech advantage for organizations today. Successful organizations understand where they are in their tech journey and what they need to do to get ahead of the pack. They identify and invest in leaders who truly understand technology's potential to drive growth. They understand that technology doesn't just sit with functional teams, it is every leader's responsibility. And perhaps most importantly, they build agile and adaptive cultures that foster innovation. Technology alone isn't the game changer. It's the people in your organization who will make the difference between staying ahead or falling behind. To learn more about how you can identify and develop your technology leadership, go to russellreynolds.com slash insights. And now back to our conversation with Jackie. Jackie, we've talked about digital transformation. That's definitely one key theme that a lot of the C-suite leaders are facing. But the other one is sustainability. We've talked a lot on this podcast about how leaders need to shift their thinking, their actions to become more sustainable organizations. I think Microsoft very much leads the pack on this, right? Because you have been carbon neutral since 2012 and are committed to being carbon negative by 2030. What's the role that technology plays in achieving these goals? Companies are starting to recognize that the social good clearly correlates to who you are as a company, what your brand is, how you gain competitive advantage, and how you are setting the stage for those who are early in career and those who care about it, and, and hopefully you've all started to see that, you know, those are the future of, of our organizations and they care about it more than anything else. And it's an attractor of talent. And as you think about Microsoft and the technology pieces, we, we published our first annual report in 2021, which was all about showing progress on our commitments to become, to your point, carbon negative, water positive, zero waste company by 2030 but also to help people understand our journey and how we are going to use our core competency, which is technology, to help drive some of that. And if you think about data, AI, IoT, all of those things, those things are critical for us to track how we're doing across all supply chains. And as regulation becomes more and more requiring of us to report, are we doing it in a consistent way and can we measure it in a consistent way? What are the things that we should be measuring? Because you're right, right? It's what gets measured gets managed. What gets measured gets treasured. <laughs> I hadn't heard that one before. I like it. <laughs> That's right. I'll give you an example in our water. We provide water replenishment. That's a measurement for us to clean water and how we reduce waste 
water in our data centers, another measure. And so I think as you think about what business you're in, whether it be carbon, water, waste, how does that relate to what you produce and how you produce it and how you consume it? Switching from your operating role to your role as a governor, being on boards, what do you see as some of the top issues, and maybe we've covered them just now, but what do you see as the issues that you're facing as a board member? As it relates to board participation, the types of people that they want with what domain expertise, risk is a big one, right? This pandemic has really put front and center the need to understand risk across, you know, existential risk. Yeah. And to have the systems thinking to understand how risk impacts you in many different ways. I mean, how many risk discussions were we having pre-pandemic about a pandemic and the impact on the supply chain? Very little. <laughs> but we now have that as a core discussion in board meetings. So risk is a big one. Um, digital. How can digital help me both from a go-to-market, new product development, increase and improve operational efficiency and digitally transform my organization so that I am always staying competitive. I think that's one as well. Cyber. Um, we all know what's going on in that space and that being a big area for us to focus on as well and making sure we have the right expertise relative to cyber and crisis management. Crisis management across the full spectrum. Then what's your responsibility as it relates to social good, right? What is your role and your brand? And how do you make sure that is integral to who you are as an organization? Um, and the final one is the war for talent. Everyone, everyone has this war for talent right now. And as you think about how you make sure you have a more inclusive environment and you are including all from all walks of life, all demographics, that's how we harness the power of talent, by being inclusive by removing the barriers to hiring. Because as I say, you know, talent is everywhere, opportunity is not. And we have to remove those systemic and structural barriers so that everyone has an opportunity. So those are the few things that I see. Well, it's interesting, we, we're publishing a book on sustainable leaders. And the first one you talk about systems thinking, the complexity of supply chains is one of the core uh, longer term innovation, this long term commitment to it doesn't work the first time you still stay committed That's right. to uh, innovation in the long term. And, and of course, the concept of inclusion. But in that case, it's not just inclusion in the corporate world, but to win sustainably, you may include your biggest competitor. That's right. Because it's the right thing to do. So there's some big overlaps here into what we're talking about, sustainable leadership and, and more to come on that. You think about the ecosystem. Again, the pandemic really heightened and highlighted the fact that we need to work better together. I mean, we got vaccines out because of the ability to think across industry, private and public, research, academia, to really then, uh, and on a global stage, right? To then understand the problem and focus on the problem on a global stage. Because if you only do it in one area, it's still going to affect another area. It's going to come right back around to you. And so this notion of systems thinking in an ecosystem to solve these problems, that is the new way of working. Yep. And yes, your competitor will be your partner. Jackie, we like to end each podcast with a set of rapid fire questions. So this is where we're going to give you five uh -oh. questions and we ask you to <laughs> reply as quickly as possible. Are you ready? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> You have many hidden talents, but what would you say is your one biggest hidden talent? Cooking. <laughs> Love it. Who was your mentor that had the biggest impact on you? My dad. My dad created the conditions for me to be where I am today. What's your favorite vacation destination? Favorite? Ooh. Well, I think favorite would be Crete. Oh, okay. there you go. If you could choose an age to remain forever, which age would you choose? 28. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. You've lived in rainy London. You've lived in rainy Seattle. Do you prefer sunshine or rain? Sunshine. Yeah, that was a no-brainer. <laughs> that was a no-brainer. Absolutely. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us today. I find it hard to believe you consider yourself an introvert, but you clearly have listened to those in the room, as you said, instill confidence in yourself and others. This concept that you and Anaz have about awareness to adapt is a superpower. 
listening to the quietest person in the room to hear better, to think about including others. It really is what you describe as a role model to help others is leadership, that you see that as part of leadership. Over time, you learn to amplify the voice of others. And adaptability, you're adapting between the private and the public sector in helping your clients adapt, helping Microsoft adapt, the ability to listen and take advantage of long cycles, whether it's innovating in government or innovating in the corporate world. And in government, it's not about the performance and compensation as much as this sense of mission and moral compass, mission, not money. To automate something to make it easier, you realized that that bank role a long time ago, that's what automation is, making a job easier. And that's what Microsoft is doing. And making it easier is about Microsoft staying relevant. To innovate in an agile way is also saying, do I as the leader have the right competencies and do I have the team? And being empathetic to the needs of those who are change leaders and those who are not. And to change as a leader, you lead with vulnerability. Accept the mistakes. No one wants to work for a know-it-all. Great line. And sustainability in the role of technology, that you see technology, whether it's AI or IoT, that you have to, in a consistent way, look at the uses of technologies, the gaps that technology can bridge across supply chains and cycles in companies. What gets measured gets treasured. And finally, as a governor, a board member, instead of uh, an operating executive, understand systems thinking and risk. Risk has risen to the fore of the board agenda. Of course, digital has, of course, cyber has, crisis management. But now it's about responsibility for social good. And finally, if you're inclusive and have great listening to build teams, you win the talent war. You don't fight the war. Thank you, Jackie, for being on Redefiners. And I think the measurement of this podcast will get treasured. Thank you, Jackie, so much. Thanks for taking the time. It's been fun having this conversation with you two. Cheers. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. For more dynamic insights from leaders from across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com. Find us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at RA on Leadership. See you next time. Do you have a question on leadership, career development, joining a board? or other topics you'd like to ask one of our consultants. Well, now's your chance. Send us your question. Email us at redefiners at russellreynolds.com for an opportunity to have your question answered on the podcast by one of our experts. See you next time on Redefiners.